everyone and welcome back to the new episode of Becoming the Product. I am still sick as you might heard or not. Um, I want to apologize for that again and hopefully I get well soon enough. Today I would like to dive into a topic that is uh, quite complicated but that I had quite a lot of interest researching and today's presentation is going to be focusing on the phenomenology of the augmented life. So first thing Uh, first. Why am I interested in this topic? Well, if you have been following my research for a little bit now, perhaps you know that I'm very interested in mind enhancement, virtual experiences and how they shape our everyday life. And recently I got more and more interested in phenomenology, which I'm going to get a bit more into uh, in a minute. But I thought concretely, how do the technological experiences that we have, whether they are virtual, whether they are in augmented, virtual or mixed reality, change the perception that we have of objects and things in the world. Because indeed, if one wants to start rationalizing and analyzing such experiences, one should focus on the specific field of research, one that very specifically analyzes the way we navigate the world. And in a nutshell, that is the very specific mission of phenomenology. And because phenomenology is such a big, vast and complex topic, and that because I am by no mean a philosopher, I will refer today to quite some specific papers and maybe do a little bit more of reading than usual, just because I want to make sure that we kind of understand quite clearly the terms, the facts and the complexes at hand within this topic. So first thing first, what is phenomenology? Well, in the Stanford Dictionary, phenomenology is described as the study of structures of consciousness as experienced from the first person point of view. The central structure of an experience is its intentionality, its being directed towards something, as in an experience of or how about some subject. End quote. Phenomenology has a rich historical lineage with diverse manifestations over the century. But it reached a pivotal stage of development in the early 20th century for the contribution of influential figures such as Husserl, Heidegger, Sartre, merleau ponty and other notable philosophers. At its core, phenomenology investigates the structures of conscious experiences from a first-person perspective, taking into account the relevant conditions that shape these experiences. These experiences encompass a wide area of types, including perception, imagination, thought, emotion, desire, volition, and action. As argued in the text Phenomenology by Paul Armstrong in the John Hopkins Guide for Literary Theory and Criticism entry, quote, the modern founder of phenomenology is the German philosopher Edmund Husserl, who thought to make philosophy a rigorous science by returning its attention to the things themselves. He does not mean by this that philosophy should become empirical, as if fact could be determined objectively and absolutely. Rather, searching for foundation on which philosophers could ground their knowledge with certainty, Herschel proposed that reflection puts out of play all unprovable assumption about the existence of object, for example, and describes what is given in experience. So we will come back to Herschel a bit later, but I want to specify here that phenomenology and the sort of ways to understand it and to use it isn't a monolith, and that, as argued previously, quite some philosophers have been working around that question, and they did not seem to always agree with each other. Some were adding more knowledge or contribution to the topic, more others were proposing another approach to phenomenology. So let's all sort of try to think here that there's not one approach, and that phenomenology is not a monolith anyway. For the sake of this research today, though we will focus specifically on the notion of herstal perception, but keep in mind that this is not the ground, let's say, um, methodology or truth when it comes to that topic. Over the century, phenomenology mainly focused on the exploration of human experience. However, phenomenologists in the later part of the 20th century emphasize in the inherent connection between experience, language, historical context, and cultural traditions. So, Let's get into it. What would I mean when I say the phenomenology of the augmented life? Well, let's start with a quote by Mark Zuckerberg. When Mark Zuckerberg introduced the company's vision for an apparently inevitable technological future and sort of introducing meta to the audience, he claimed, quote, Isn't that the ultimate promise of technology? To be together with anyone, to be able to teleport anywhere, and to create and experience anything. End quote. 
Well, when I choose to talk about the augmented life, because to me, a phenomenology of technology would be too vague and too abstract for such format, I would like to say that I would focus on very specific uses of technology in our everyday life. There exists still literature and books on the phenomenology of technology at large, and I will highly recommend you to look into it if you're interested, but we won't focus on this today. Instead, we shall look into what I mean here by the augmented life. Well, to make it very simple and sharp, I refer to any digital devices, tool or experiences that are adding to our perception, whether visual or mental. This could be, for example, the application Pokemon Go, which is augmented reality. It could be the Instagram filter, which is mixed reality. It would be media echo chamber, which is in some way some sort of online content mediation. It could also be body dysmorphia phenomenology that is induced by the content that we see online and that does make us perceive ourselves in different ways. And it could also be the Google Glasses, which are a form of augmented slash mixed reality. I know that all of these experiences differ and that they cannot be put into one box. Still, they all refer to some sort of kind of idea of augmented notion or additional notion or virtuality, um, which we will dive into a bit more today. There was not much sources on the phenomenology of the augmented life. Um, there was still a lot of research on uh, phenomenology and virtuality. And I'm going to use quite some concepts from this field of research today to start building my argument. And to do that, let's get right into it with the amazing, while still very complex book of the phenomenology of virtual technology by Daniel O'Shiel. As argued in the book, Daniel O'Shiel writes, quote, Virtuality is fast becoming the base mode of many people's life. Portions of humanity's youngest generation may be the first to be more familiar chatting to their friend online than in person. At the time of writing a video game like Rocket League always has around 80 players online, no matter the time of the day or night. And in 2016, one individual in New Zealand, Tom Curry, quit his job in order to play Pokemon Go full-time." End quote. In this book, which is very complex but that I still highly recommend, the writer dives into different understanding and aspects of phenomenology in order to, in a later moment, relate to technology and virtuality. He starts with Herschel's perception and, has, and Herschel's eternal quest into trying to understand how object appears to us. He writes, quote, In Herschel terms, this most basic form is the unmodified mode of perceptual consciousness, which, by its very nature, is one of automatic positing belief in the independence and durability of things, even in the face of conscious variation and absence." End quote. In this text, the researcher stresses us to understand how, when we try to exercise phenomenology, there exists a difference in between perceiving and fantasizing. Quote, Fantasizing is set in opposition to perceiving and to the intuitive posting of past and future as true. In short, to all act that posit something individual and concrete as existing. Perception makes a present reality appear to us as present and as a reality. Memory places an absence reality before our eyes, not in this as present itself, but, as, but certainly as reality. Fantasy, on the other hand, lacks the consciousness of reality in relation to what is fantasized." End quote. So why is it so interesting and important to make this differentiation? Well, because in the exercise of phenomenology, it is important, and we will get that to that in a moment, to understand how do things come to us, whether they are concretely existing in reality, whether they are depicted by an object in reality, whether we are imagining them, but they refer to something that we actually know, or whether we imagine them based on something that we actually have not experienced or haven't seen. Daniel Hoshiel continues, quote, Thus, in the usual walk of life, the basic difference between perception and fantasy means they mutually exclude each other at any given moment. In other words, one cannot perceive and fantasize at the same time. In Herschel on Sturm, as soon as we focus our attention on perceptual object, the fantasy field is gone." End quote. And I bet you know why I chose this specific quote here. Because indeed, in the phenomenology of augmented life, it seems that fantasy and perception, perhaps, could be reunited. But before we dive more into this, let's 
look a bit more closely about some key terms of Ursula's understanding of the phenomenology of perception, and that is mainly related to the problem of image consciousness. So what is it and how does it help us better understand the complexities of augmented life? Well, in Ursula Ohm's term, image consciousness as a structure of its own, with three essential components that nonetheless already interlock the actual life experience. There is the physical image, the, the thing made from canvas, marble and so on. There is the representing or depicting object, the image object, and the represented or depicted object, the image subject. End quote. Daniel O'Shea writes, quote, In this manner, the physical image is real and greatly conditioned the image object, actually limiting this latter to only a few options. My brother, Pierre, a child, a duck, a rabbit. Moreover, the content of the image subject can be real or not, but it is never actually there like the photo is. It is inherently absent. But things are not as simply categorized as it could be, and this is what Ursul tries to emphasize with the problems of the image consciousness. Indeed, Daniel Hochschild writes, quote, Ursul is equally, if not more, concerned with the status of image consciousness as he is with perception and fantasy. Moreover, he is quite open as to its rather perplexing position. It is characterized as a curious hybrid that seems to contain elements that are there, which are real perceivable, and yet others that are not, that are real fantasizable. When I look at a photograph, for example, there are actual perceived elements that are evidently there before me in my hand, the actual photo, and yet the photo also depicts something or someone that is decidedly not there, perhaps never was, and perhaps never can be again." End quote. So therefore, in Ursula's argument, it is possible that image consciousness might be considered a hybrid representing a blend of perception and imagination. As such, image consciousness encompasses various aspects, including how we form and maintain mental ex images, how we distinguish between perceptual experiences and imaginative experiences, and how we recognize the difference between real objects and the images we construct in our mind. Herschel's analysis of image consciousness is an integral part of his broader exploration of the structure of consciousness and how they relate to the world. But what can, for example, image consciousness be then concretely? Well, rather simply, it can be recalling a memory, imagining a scene, visualizing future scenarios, etc. And I want to specify here that whatever Herschel's research on the problem of image consciousness and sort of being able to understand how to separate certain kind of mental, visual and perceptual experiences, he was by no means content or finished with the reflection that he had started. As argued in the book, quote, However, given the complex nature of the work, as well as its explorative tone, it is quite clear to me that Herschel was never fully satisfied with any ultimate conception or decision, especially when it came to fantasy, image consciousness, and their ultimate relation, end quote. So I would like to specify here that these, co these key themes are extremely complex and that they all relate to the idea of perceiving object and understanding what is imaginary, what is real, what is fantasized. And please look more into those concepts and how they differ if you are interested in those. It was just important for us in the first place to mention how those important distinctions were the basis of phenomenology for us to later on understand how the phenomenology of the augmented life might be a very complex, still fascinating inquiry. Because one could ask, why is Herschel so relevant when one tries to understand the phenomenology of augmented life? And how is the problem of image consciousness related to technology? Well, as argued in the text, quote, with the ever-increasing presence of certain technologies di like digital screens, image consciousness is a more prominent and important category than ever before. This can hardly be overstated. Digital screens do not only take up vast portion of our life, we will see that they are also starting to blur, invert or even collapse the previously clear distinction between perceiving on one hand and fantasizing on the other, precisely because of their middle phenomenological position." End quote. One could say that because of the different augmented tools and experiences that we have in our, in our everyday life, there can be a feeling of constantly digital daydreaming. Um, this is a term that could be used to 
sort of explain a constant world making in which our perception is shaped in between the things we see, the things we've read, the things we've created, the things we have actually designed. And this entire sort of world making is constantly shaping and changing, not only based on what is out there in the world, but also based in our mental age century and this idea of the post production in the everyday life. And if the notion of virtuality in our everyday was something that has always existed, if virtuality is something that is almost but not there, if virtuality is something that could be experienced when one was reading a novel, daydreaming in the park, watching a movie, it seems nowadays though that there's an important distinction that needs to be made in between the idea of real virtualities and irreal virtualities. And this is something that Daniel Oshil also focuses on in his book. As argued, quote, if real virtuality is at the categories of the self, world, and other values on the perceptual level, and if presentification takes up material from perception, our retention and memory, then it stands to reason that these virtual elements can and even must be taken up in presentification too. End quote. But on the contrary, he writes that, quote, Irreal is thus opposed to actual and current perception and is therefore quite broad, broader than just fantasy and things that do not really exist. It is much of what I can access from my mind, other than perception, from memories to fantasies." End quote. And so, as previously mentioned, given the previously given concept of phenomenology and our rapidly demand for more and more digitally generated experiences, it becomes harder and harder for individuals to, sometimes, distinguish the thing that they've seen, curated, chosen not to see, always trolling in virtuality. I suppose that by now it would be interesting or helpful for all of us to get some sort of examples of what this phenomenology of augmented life could look like. So let's look into it. So of course, one of the most, let's say, obvious experience would be how social media shapes our everyday life. And if for now it is not likely that social media could, let's say, supplant all possible stream of perception, it is nevertheless, I suppose, fair to say that because of the way we consume social media and Instagram and different media channels and TikTok or whatsoever, it kind of supplants already a big part of our everyday life, meaning that in some direct ways it also alters our perception and how we relate to the world. Some of the, let's say, issues that one could be concerned with when we think about the phenomenology of social media is related to the idea of filtering, whether it's filtering information or even filtering and adding some sort of enhancement to your physical appearance. It could be the echo chambers, it could be fake news, body dysphoria, deep fake news, deep fake information, deep fake visuals, etc. If we think about the technologies that are related to VR, AR and mixed reality, Daniel Hoshiel writes, quote, Virtual reality has been around on and off in various forms since the late 60s. Augmented reality, for its part, is as much a more recent phenomenon. However, as we will see, it is already showing signs of surpassing VR in its potential cope, popularity and use. Finally, mixed reality is a new media that is not yet really fixed, neither in concept nor in a particular physical piece of technology. When we think about the phenomenology of VR, AR and MR, some of the issues that one can start thinking about is accident in the AR slash physical world, digital deception, and also constant feeling of digital daydreaming. And if we go back a bit to the idea of reality, fantasizing, imagining that we previously mentioned based on Husserl's conception of perception, how does this VR, AR and mixed reality relate to this concept? Well, Daniel O'Shea writes, quote, VR is transportation into digital virtual realm and thus is wholly imaginary. AR, when it takes place with some kind of digital screen, remains an imaginary experience. However, it should become clear that the lines are already starting to blur. Indeed, the whole point of AR technologies is to superimpose objects into our realities to the extent that, functionally at least, there is little difference." End quote. So if we go back to what we have previously argued for in regard to the question of phenomenology and the study of the subjective experience, and especially in regards to perception, we can start seeing how complex things get. 
Indeed, in a world filled with screens, filter, echo chamber, and augmented visualization, the act of perceiving, imagining, and fantasizing might just become one, and leave individual endlessly strolling in their little rendered fantasy. And why would that be an issue? Because after all, virtuality has always existed, as I have previously said. Whether it was about watching a film, reading a novel, or simply fanning into one's own thoughts. Well, now that we have covered what we meant by phenomenology of the augmented life or phenomenology of virtuality, we should dive more into the reasons why such investigation is necessary and the kind of outcome that such perception and illusions could have. Let's look into the text Augmented Reality, Augmented Epistemology and the Real World Web by Cody Turner. It is a very helpful text in order to understand how technologies already change and will shape the future of our perception and lives. All of this paper focuses on augmented epistemology and not phenomenology. It is a relevant one to locate some of the issues that might appear when trying to assess personal experiences within the augmented life. To clarify here the difference between epistemology and phenomenology, epistemology wonders what is knowledge and how do we acquire knowledge? While phenomenology wonders about how do experiences present themselves to us? How do we perceive and interpret the world? Still, the philosophy of phenomenology and epistemology have in common interest. They both sort of question and research the philosophy of perception. That's why I think this paper is still a very high value for what we're trying to say today. In the text, the researcher emphasizes on three main point aspects as potential outcomes of the augmented world. Digital distraction, digital deception, and digital divergence. He writes, quote, Augmented reality does not yet have an ubiquitous presence in society, but the technology is poised to have a positive impact on a variety of industries beyond just entertainment, including but not limited to healthcare, education, retail, manufacture, and tourism. In this text, he makes a quite interesting differentiation between the World Wide Web, which is what we existed in previously, and the ambitions of the World World Web. To make this Differentiation, he writes, quote, The goal of the real world web is not to escape the physical world by fully immersing human agents within cyberspace, but rather to enhance the physical world by overlaying virtual content onto sorcery perception, end quote. So with the real world web, there's really this idea of almost not dissociating anymore the screen, the internet, the experience, and the real world. No, the real world web would be a constant exponential of augmented life and virtuality within our own concrete physical world. So let's come back to the main three key points that he mentioned in this paper. The first one is digital distraction. Of course, if we imagine the real world web as a real thing or the augmented life as the sort of like constant stream of information and things that comes to our head, either through AR, VR, mind enhancement, or just through the own, our own fantasy and imagina- imagination, one could think about digital distraction and start speculating on digital wellness and augmented ad blocking, for example. A problem that quite some people already experience if we think about how hard it is for us to disconnect from our devices. But another problem that I think is much more interesting from a fantasy or illusion perspective is the issue of digital deception. In this paper, the researcher writes, quotes, In addition to magnifying the problem of digital distraction, the real world web is also poised to engender a new type of digital deception. As stated in the introduction, I understand digital deception in a broad sense to include any use of digital technologies to generate false or misleading appearance of reality. Free contemporary forms of digital deceptions are fake news articles, fake images, and deep fake videos. So this is what I mentioned earlier, right? How are we supposed to sort of apprehend and judge and sort of define how things come to us if, you know, in the future, everything that comes to us is artificially rendered. Another problem that the researcher poses is the idea of real-world filter bubbles and the problem of other augmented minds. So what does he mean by that? Well, that is the question of digital divergence, right? And this is something that is already happening. When people consume certain type of content, certain type of media, they start really sort of like living in their own sort of like own world of belief, maybe even of conspiracies. And because they really believe that the world is created in such a way, they start believing that this is exactly how things are. 
The researcher writes, quote, I submit that the real-world filter bubble concern can be likened to a version of the problem of the other mind. The problem of the other mind is an epistemological problem that derives from the fact that we can never directly experience the mind of other agents, but instead merely infer that they have in mind based on their intelligible behavior. So what does that mean exactly? Well, that means that Let's say we would all live in an augmented world. Um, well, surely people would have a diversity of opinions and experiences, which would make it quite hard for us to sort of be able to understand what another person has seen, another person has understood. But there's an additional other problem, right? Because we could think that the augmented life will be a universal right somehow, but it quite likely will not be. So then what does that imply? Well, that implies that some players will have certain type of experiences in relation to the world, while others people will simply not be enhanced, simply not be players, simply not live an augmented life. And therefore, there might be an even bigger gap in between the people that actually experience such sort of like digital fantasizing, digital illusion, digital deceptions, and the one that will simply not. And how are we supposed to have conversations in between people that are constantly overseeing and sort of imagining and working into a world of artificially rendered object when quite some other people will not have this opportunity. So enough paper here, let's speculate for a bit. I hope that through displaying the most basic um, understanding of phenomenology and some quite mundane use of technology, I have been able to sort of raise your curiosity about what would the phenomenology of an augmented life look like? What would be its methodology? How can we even proceed to such an exercise uh, in our current day and age? Will this augmented life separate it more and more in terms of how we relate to the world and understand it? Although phenomenology is not an objective science, it's supposed to be some sort of like, let's say, science of subjective consciousness. How does this augmented life sort of enhance that power, but at the same time make it hardly possible for us to be empathic towards others or to even be able to understand the world that they're currently living in? How, when I meet someone, would I know if they have seen what I've seen? if they have read what I've read, and if they know what I know. Of course, that is a basic question that one could have, even when we're not thinking about the augmented life. But I hope that today, with the current example that I've given, I can sort of emphasize how complex those conversations can be in the future, if we don't think beforehand about how to best possible create a sort of common understanding of what the augmented life can be. And with that being said, I would like to refer to some sort of books and films that I believe are a good example of what can happen when the augmented life goes wrong. So of course there is It in the Sunshine of the Spotless Mind by Michael Gondry, while Joanne and Clementine meet, feel in love and break up. And unbeknownst to them, they had their memories of each other erased. When Joel decides to erase his own memories of Clementine, he realizes he wants to keep her love story alive within this mind. So what's interesting about this movie is that in a way, the augmented life being the, the sort of choice to be able to keep some memories or not, create this huge divergence between these two characters, with one remembering a love story and the other one completely dismissing it. There is also the series Kiss Me First by Misha Manson Smith. It follows Leila, a young woman using virtual reality game to escape real-world challenges. She forms a deep bond with Tess, a fellow gamer, but Tess mysteriously disappears from both worlds. What's interesting about Kiss Me First is that this is sort of like constant search and in-betweenness, in-between physical and virtual world, leading the characters to, at some point, kind of not being able to sort of really differentiate um, what belongs where. And I also want to mention this book that I personally haven't read, but that I suppose could be a great hint for the phenomenology of the augmented life, which is When Gravity Fails by George Alec Effinger. I haven't read this book, but apparently it has a lot also to do with mind enhancement, drug usage and isolation from the character from the rest of the world. So perhaps that's also an interesting uh, reference to look into. Today, I mainly focus on these two papers because I believe that phenomenology, vitreity and augmented life are such vague, big and sort of like monstrous topic that I thought it would be easier to mainly focus on those. I hope this was interesting to you. I hope it raised your curiosity on what phenomenology is and how our digital lives are somehow complexifying this experience, methodology and science. And thanks for looking at me listening to me and I see you next time in the next video. Bye.